Well, here we are. Happy second birthday, Real Life Church. This is our second birthday. This is our second anniversary, and this is our third vision day together. Uh, and I want to give you a little history lesson. I know some of you are new to the church. We actually have some first-time guests here today. I don't know how you found us, but thank you. I want to give you a little bit of a history lesson. A couple years ago, we were uh, formed as a church, and as you know, we were not formed in the usual way. We were formed out of a crisis. We were formed out of the uh, collapsing of a, a ministry that had lasted for years and the dispersing of a staff that I loved. And we came to a day where hundreds of people were disoriented and disappointed, and I was depressed and afraid. And at that point, we weren't sure what the future looked like. I had sent out applications all over the country, and I was assuming that the day would come where I was going to move, where your kids and mine would not go to school together. So one day, Zach Swire and Brian Clay called me up on the phone, and they said, hey, we don't know where to go to church this weekend. We want to have a Bible study in a park. I said, okay, can we have a Bible study in a park? It was Thursday. I said, sure, Bible study in a park. I don't know what I'm doing. Let's, let's do that. They called me back the next day, Friday, and they said, you're leading it right because we don't really know how to do that. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, how many people are coming? And they said, 30 or 40. It's just us and our families and a few friends. I said, okay. We showed up that morning uh, in that park, uh, and we were unprepared. It was a hot day, and we had picked a park with no bathroom. <laughs> Little did we know. I stood next to Zach and Brian and Mark and Craig, and we stood together, and I listened to them whispering. And they said, wait, how did he find out? Did you invite him? How did she find out? How did word get around? And we stood there as 30 people showed up. And then 40, and then 50, and then 60, and then 100. And 140 of you were there that morning. Let me see it. How many of you were there in the park that morning two years ago? Yeah, a few of us remember it. Yeah, but look at how many people are new. We, uh, we gathered that morning. We had our little Bible study with the surprise crowd. And, you know, we were just kind of pulling things together. And I said, hey, what if the vision of the church was just that we love everybody and you're next? At the end of the Bible study, Brian Clay stood up and did something that I will never forgive. <laughs> now, I had applications out to a church in Austin, Texas, which had called and said, buy a plane ticket, you're our top candidate, come out and interview. There was a church in Colorado that had called and said, buy a plane ticket, come out, interview, you're our top candidate. I was going to do that that week. Brian Clay stood up at the end of our little Bible study and said... You need to know two things. One, Jim is a man of integrity, and I trust him. Two, we feel like this is a movement that shouldn't die, and we feel like it should be a church, and Jim's agreed to stay. <laughs> Jim had agreed to no such thing. But Brian Clay won the gold medal in the decathlon a few years ago. His face is on the front of a Wheaties box. You can't pants that guy in front of a crowd of people. So I nodded, and there we were. <laughs> One of you spontaneously at that moment took off a baseball cap and passed it around. That was our first offering, which we were also unprepared for. The next week, we didn't even meet. We had no plans. We had no location. We didn't know where to go. We didn't have a staff. I was a volunteer. We didn't have an org chart. We didn't have a budget. We didn't have all the things that you kind of do when you're thinking ahead. We didn't have bathrooms. We had nothing. So the next week, we didn't meet. The week after that, we met in the Lafetra Center, a little rental facility in Glendora. They were the ones who could take us in, and we piled in there. How many of you were there at the Lafetra Center that week? Oh, a few more, yeah. Word got around, yeah. 250 people showed up that week, and we violated the fire code. The next week, Sandberg was gracious enough to take us in. Sandberg said, you can, you can come have church over here. And we, we met for the first time at Sandberg again. No plans. Didn't know week to week where we were coming. Randy Center showed up with equipment. Nobody called him. He just did it. Things just came together at that moment. And honestly, I was still uncertain of what was happening. I remember I went back and watched the, the uh, sermon from the second week we met together at Sandberg. And I stood up on that Sunday and looked out at the now gathering crowd and said, I'm going to go out of limb and risk saying this. We're going to have to go to two services. And sure enough, here we are a year later. How many of you were there when we first met at Sandburg? How many of you were there right at the beginning? Yeah. 
Yeah. And since then, we've baptized 67 people together as a church. We, we baptized more this year than we did the first year. How many of you want to baptize even more people next year? So that is how we came to be, and I just have one thing that I'd like to say, because I know he's watching online today, he's moved up to Seattle, but Brian Clay, thank you so much for being willing to start Real Life Seattle. Just smile and nod, Brian. (laughs) Just smile and nod, that's what I did, right? Who knows what the future holds, but today is our vision day, and it's a day where we traditionally look at all God has done in our past and all God might be calling us to in the future. I want to show you a little map of the impact that we've had. This map on the screens coming up is everybody we've touched since we formed as a church. Look at the dots on that map, and look at how far it extends. It actually, I can't see it from here. It goes wider, but I think that's the one of the immediate area. Now, let me, let me tie this to a biblical analogy. If you're with us on Sunday mornings at Sandburg at 9 and 1030, you know we're reading through the book of Exodus together. And Exodus is a remarkable book, and we're about to read it like we've never read it before because we're about to live the book of Exodus as we read it. Exodus starts with, with Moses who grows up in Egypt, grows up the, the prince of the king, the prince of the pharaoh. And the day comes where he sees, where he's, sees a, a Hebrew Uh, a, a Hebrew slave being beaten by an Egyptian slave master. And Moses moves to intercede to save the slave that's being beaten, and he ends up killing the Egyptian slave master. On that day, Moses was moved by compassion, and he committed murder. He didn't realize that God was moved with compassion, and God was going to commit a mutiny. God was about to bring about a revolution that would overturn Egypt and and overthrow the Pharaoh and set his people free. But because Moses got in front of God, because Moses moved first, Moses had to flee into the wilderness and live for decades on his own as a simple shepherd waiting for God's call. The day would come where God's compassion and Moses' compassion would coincide again and God would speak out of a burning bush and call Moses to go back and set the people free. And that's what real life is. We are the place where God's compassion and our compassion coincide. We exist to lead lost people to Jesus. That's what God wants. That's what we want. When we do this together, when we follow God's vision, we are unstoppable. This is the vision that God has for us as a church. And honestly, it's the mutiny of all times. We are in rebellion against lifeless religion. I have a friend who invited some of her atheist friends to church. Despite the fact that they do not like church and they did not want to go to church, they were interested in ours. And I asked her, why did they care? What was it about our church that made them interested? And she said, well, I didn't really tell them it was called Real Life Church. I told them it was called Rebel Church. They were interested in that. (laughs) That's not exactly a bad name. We are a church that is in rebellion against lifeless religion and out on a mission to lead lost people to Jesus. Now, I want to look today at how God called Moses, at the way God spoke to Moses out of a burning bush and what he was called to, because this is a call that defines us. This is in Exodus chapter 3, starting at verse 1. You can open it up in your uh, your devices if you want or watch on the screen. Listen to the word of God. Now, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. 
So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a, a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and a number of other people I have trouble pronouncing. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what's his name? Then what should I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are, say, what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Now, let me tie this to our story. The gathering in the park was our burning bush. It was God's call to us, to a vision that was bigger than us, to an unexpected vision. We could have settled quietly into normal life, but God called us to something we had not expected. And when God calls you, you have to go. I mean, the only thing I share in common with Moses was that when God called, I said, you sure you don't want to send somebody else? But when God calls us, if we reject God's call, it's not a failure of faithfulness, it's a failure of compassion. Because when God calls us, he calls us to go out in love. And so we as a people are called to go out and love lost people. Real life is not a gathering of tradition and ritual. We are not doing stereotypical church. We are not doing the church that you are used to. You can go to all kinds of churches in the area that offer an entertaining buffet of programs and preachers, and that's not what we are. My fear for churches like that is that what they will produce over time is well-trained customers of the church. And I do not want us to be that. Here at Real Life, in 20 years, it will be absolutely impossible for you to be a well-trained customer of the church. It just won't work. In 20 years from now, you will have slept around far too many boxes to be a customer. You will have held far too many crying babies to be a customer. You will have visited too many hospitals to be a customer. In 20 years from now, at Real Life, what you will be is a disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's the call. That's the call that we would love a lost world and be disciples of Jesus. Listen, what I don't want to be is a lot like something the Israelites would have seen when Moses got them where they were going. Moses would lead them into, into Israel, into their promised land, and in the middle of that is a, a body of water called the Dead Sea. Uh, you may have you've seen it, you've heard of it, the Dead Sea. It is actually the, the lowest place on flat land, 1,400 feet below sea level. And as a consequence, all kinds of things have poured into it. Rivers can pour into it. Rain can pour into it. It drags all kinds of salt and minerals into it, but nothing can pour out. It is at the lowest possible point. All it does is collect things. As a result, it is called the Dead Sea because the saline content, the salt content, is so high. If you go out here to Santa Monica, the, the salt content of the ocean is about 3.5%. The Dead Sea has a saline content of 33%. It, it's so full of salt, nothing can live in it. Now, it's, it's a rich body of water. It has all kinds of minerals. All kinds of things have poured into it. For years, for centuries, things have poured into it and poured into it and poured into it. And it hasn't let go of any of it. It's a rich body of water. But it's dead. It's rich and it's dead. Because nothing flows out of it. And the same thing happens to the church. If real life were to become a church that just lets things pour in, that just collects things for ourselves, that just tries to keep together a group of insiders, we may grow rich and we will be dead. That is lifeless church. That's not the church that Jesus came to create. We are a church that exists to pour out and to pour out and to pour out in love until we have to turn to God and say, fill us with whatever you want. We got nothing left. The vision of the church is that God's compassion for the world and our compassion for the world would coincide and that we would go out in love to reach a lost world in his name. Real life exists to lead lost people to Jesus. 
To fail to do so is not a failure of faithfulness, it's a failure of compassion. And so I have a two-part vision for us that I want to name for this year. A two-part vision of where we're going and what we're doing. Number one, I envision a church in which everybody loves at least one person enough to introduce them to Jesus. It's such a simple thing, but honestly, I'm afraid most churches aren't doing it. This is the vision that God has put on my heart. Everybody has to love at least one person enough to introduce them to Jesus. And if we do that consistently and faithfully over the next 52 weeks, in a year from now, we'll be violating more fire codes. And that's what rebel churches do. Think about what would happen. I mean, I mean, think about this. Here we are at our two-year anniversary. We've been around for two years. What if the vision in the next year was that everybody just loves one person enough for the next 52 weeks to introduce them to Jesus? I mean, literally, in a year, we double. What a, what a great vision. It, it is not by accident that we gather here on 9-9-18. You can remember it this way. It was a doubling kind of day. As you feast on double-doubles after the service, you can think, wow, those guys who forgot to have a bathroom at the first service have learned how to plan ahead. (laughs) What if the vision for this year was that we just love everybody enough to double? Now, I'm not saying that because I want a big church. I don't want a big church. I do not want a big church. But I want to plant churches. I want to put more churches on the earth. I mean, what if there really was a a real-life Seattle, Brian Clay? I mean, I mean, think about it. We named ourselves Real Life LA. Why should there not be a Real Life OC? Why should there not be a Real Life San Bernardino? Why can't we have a Real Life Tijuana? Everything's fair game. But that's the kind of vision the church ought to have. We're not here for ourselves. We're here to multiply disciples who are making disciples. That's part one of the vision. Everybody loves just one person enough to introduce them to Jesus. Uh, You got a little green card when you came in. There was a green card on your chair. It says Vision Day on it. On the other side, there's a place where you can sign in. Grab that card right now. Pick that card up. Uh, If you need more, we've got more at the door that you can grab on the way out, but grab one right now. And I want you to do four things with this card. One, right now, in this moment. Right now, in this moment, I want you to talk to Jesus. And I want you to ask Jesus to put someone on your heart that you can love for the next 52 weeks. Enough to introduce them to Jesus. Just ask, ask Jesus to put that name and that face on your heart right now. Now, don't run and put down the spouse that you've been nagging for the last 10 years. We get it. But ask God to put a name and a face on your heart. And write that name down on that card. We're going to pray for those people together this year as a church. Secondly, as you write that card down, think about how you can pray for that person when you meet them. When you see that person, a great introduction to conversations about faith is to say, hey, how can I pray for you? Is there anything you need prayer for? Hey, I'm praying for you. That often opens up the conversations uh, that that we need to have. Thirdly, uh, after after the sermon, the the offering plates will go by. Put those cards in the offering plate. We're going to collect those together and use those to create a a wall of prayer for people in need this year. Uh, Take those cards and use those as the initiation uh, for our plan this year. And then think, fourthly, What can I invite this person to? If it's somebody who doesn't go to church, maybe a worship service isn't the first thing. Maybe they'd come to Alpha and have a free dinner and learn to talk about spiritual things with us. Maybe they'd come to Financial Peace University because they want to get their finances in order no matter what the God stuff is all about. Maybe they just have a kid who wants to come to a fun and life-changing kids program. Or maybe you just have a dinner party at your house and invite them over to start this conversation. But begin praying about how you're going to enter into conversations with that person that could change their eternity. Secondly, uh, as you know, as I shared with you last week, uh, we are uh, a church that is going to be on the move this year. When we began at Sandburg, we shook hands with the school district and said, we need at least three years. Banks want to see three years of financial statements before they'll make you a loan to buy a building. The school system said yes. They don't want a church in their schools forever. This this was not a long-term plan for them. But they said, yes, you can have three years. We're now at year two. In one year, we should have what we need to be able to talk to banks. The day's going to come where we move out of Sandburg into a new place, and I do not yet know what that promised land looks like. What I know is this. There are options, and I'm going to name a few that the staff and the board have been talking about and thinking about and praying over. I bet there's at least one more we haven't thought of 
So if God puts that on your heart, you let me know. Number one, we may end up buying a building. That might be what we do next. That's entirely possible. We've looked at different buildings, but I'll tell you, I'm not going to get ahead of God on this one. There was a church in Pomona that was for sale, but it had 25 parking spots and it was 20 minutes away. There was a tiny little church in San Dimas for sale that had zero parking spots. I didn't really feel like that was the call. I think today we, we've witnessed that, right? Uh, so so don't, don't get ahead of God on this one. But number one, we might end up buying a building. Two, we could take out a long-term lease on a property. It, it could be that the next place we rent is a big hall like this one where we can do anything we want on the inside and we lease it out. Or three, maybe it's something completely creative and out of the box. Maybe it's something like uh, moving church to a different time of the day. There's a, a giant church in Nashville with like 6,000 people in it, and they only have services in the evenings on Sunday. I'm not saying that's the thing. I'm just saying I'm going to be open to God's call, and I want us to be open to God's call together. Who knows where he will lead? But I do know right now for this season what God is doing is God is having us read the book of Exodus like we've never read it before. God is having us go through the book of Exodus together and become the object lesson of the book as we read it. We know what it's like to be a people on the run looking for a place to have worship, looking for a place to be free. We know what it's like to, to be wandering in the wilderness, not sure what's coming next. And the day's going to come where we know what it feels like to be in a promised land, a home that is our own. Everywhere the Israelites go in the book of Exodus, this, you'll see it. Everywhere they wander, they set up church. They set up a mobile, portable church called the Tabernacle. It's their, their place that they, they open up every time they settle down for a day to have worship. It's places like this where when you're on the move, you grab a venue that works and you make it happen. The Tabernacle becomes this place where everywhere they go, they set it up and they make worship, the worship of God the center of their community. So I'm going to have you do one other thing in relation to the, the second vision for this year. On the way out, there, there's these little foam Legos that look like this that say Real Life LA on it. Because what you need around your house is more junk. <laughs> Grab one of these Legos on the way out the door. Uh, and it's a cute memento of our second anniversary. But this is what I want you to do with it. I want you to put it somewhere in your house where you'll see it every day. Put it on the windowsill. Put it by the sink. Put it in the bathroom. Put it wherever you'll see it every day. And when you see this brick, pray that God would build his kingdom here on earth through you and through us. Pray for a vision of where God is calling us to go next. Take this and remember that God is leading us. They experienced being a people on the move uh, in the wilderness. And Moses up at the front, I think, was unsure of himself the whole time. This is the guy who said to God, I think you better send somebody else. Listen, God gave him a final answer for why he was to do what he did. God gives us a final answer for why we do what we do. When people ask you why you are the church, tell them, it's because we worship the God who is the I am. When they ask you why you give up your life for Jesus, why you live in generosity and love and self-sacrifice, tell them it's because you know the God who is the I am. Amen? Amen? When you are the rebel church that does not do things like other churches are doing and people say, why do you do it that way? Tell them it is because you worship the God who is the I am. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, by your spirit, move in this room and touch our hearts. Give us a vision for our lives that we might be your disciples and your church. Change us and make us your own. And may our lives bear witness to Jesus that everything we do points in your direction. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.